In order to understand the present, we must understand the past. Although our ancient history is strange and usually unbelievable, there are solid links to present day events. These links explain current events and global politics. In this presentation, we will walk through time. The more you watch, the more connections you will see. There is an obvious pattern. We just have to cast our net wide enough. Far back in history, we find the Shining Ones. It's not clear who they were or where they came from. Some say Atlantis, Antarctica, Cro-Magnon Man, Unknown Hominid, Interdimensional, Supernatural, or even Extraterrestrials. I don't believe it's aliens. I'd consider all the other options, especially Unknown Hominid, with an interdimensional connection. Humans bred with different ancient hominids, hence the different races or hybrids. Could the Shining Ones be another hominid? The descriptions of them indicate they were human-like, but taller. Over many years I've traced the so-called Illuminati back in time. I came to the conclusion that their origin lies in ancient mythology. The gods of our past, royalty, priests and black magic are intertwined. The date is 9700 BC. Earth had come to the end of the last ice age. Warm weather had returned. Mankind was still a hunter-gatherer. Although our lives were basic and sometimes brutal, we were free. But all that was about to change. Gobekli Tepe, the first organized religious temple, date 9600 BC, location Turkey. All the world's religions start here, followed by agriculture and the first cities. One might ask, what on earth do these T-shaped pillars depict? In the center of the whole story are the T-shapes, because we can understand the T-shape as a stylized human being. We can be sure because in some cases we have the arms and we have the fingers depicted. So we have a stylized human being, this is a, a T-shapes as human beings, and so we understand these stone circles as a gathering, as a meeting of such stone beings. Two very important in the center, surrounded by other ones which are looking similar, which are smaller, less in size. This first gathering that laid the foundation stone of uncharted human history apparently happened at Gobekli Tepe. Cranial deformation or head binding appears around the world. First in Australia, 9400 BC, then in China, then in Shanidar Cave in Iraq. Cranial deformation was present across the ancient world in different and unrelated cultures, including the Mayans, Egyptians, Huns and Polynesians. Were they trying to imitate someone or something they'd seen? On the right, we can see Shanadar Cave, where the elongated skulls were found in Iraq. On the left, we can see Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Nearby is Nivali Churi, another archaeological site. Nivali Churi, date 8400 BC, location Turkey. Top left, they found a head with a snake. This is the same concept as Kundalini, shown by the sitar worn by the Brahmin Vedic priest in the middle picture. Kundalini Awakening, Sacred Fire. In Hinduism, Kundalini is a form of divine feminine Shiva energy, a coiled serpent at the base of the spinal cord, awaiting awakening. Here are some descriptions of Kundalini. If the evolution of the soul is not accompanied by the evolution of the body, the soul won't be able to impress the inner experiences upon the physical brain. The soul won't be able to transfer the insights derived through the intuitive intelligence to the body and therefore cannot be used by the soul and the higher beings to manifest the divine plan on earth. A light filled energy that rises up through the meridians, the chakras and then the hypothalamus. This correlates with illumination and activation of the third eye. The activation of the seven chakras is the key to making the philosopher's stone. An occult description of the caduceus of Hermes, seen on the left, 
is that the serpents represent positive and negative charges of Kundalini. By opening the third eye, a channel is being created to higher beings that have a plan. Here's Andrew Collins with another object found at Navali Churi. In the descriptions given in the book, that before angels actually gained physical wings, they actually had feather coats, iridescent feather coats, in one of the descriptions. So, as I said, I think you see an impression of the first angel. Enoch from the Bible said, And there appeared to me two men, exceedingly big, so that I never saw such on earth. Their faces were shining like the sun, their eyes too were like burning light, and from their lips was fire, coming forth with clothing and singing of various kinds in appearance, purple. Their wings were brighter than gold, their hands whiter than snow. We have men being described here, but perhaps not normal men. Amram was the father of Moses. Here's his description of angels. I saw watchers in my vision, the dream vision. Two men were fighting over me. They told me they had been empowered and rule over all mankind. I raised my eyes and looked. One of them was terrifying in his appearance, like a serpent, his cloak many coloured yet very dark. And I looked again and in his appearance his face was like a viper. The Abed culture began in Iraq, 6500 BC followed by the Vinca culture in the Balkans, 5700 BC. The Vinca may have had the first written language. Both cultures made objects with serpent features. The Sumerian gods were known as the Shining Ones, or Anuna, Anunnaki, from Sumeria, Iraq. They start to appear around 5400 BC. The Anunnaki are referred to in the Bible as the Elohim, or Fallen Angels. The Book of Enoch calls them the Watchers. The names of the Mesopotamian gods who bore the title Ushum Gel, or Great Serpent, or Dragon, are Anu, Enki, Enlil, Ningishida, Dumuzi, Marduk, and Inanna, or otherwise known as Ishtar. We're really interested in Anu, Enki, Enlil, and Ningishida in this story. Here are some examples of the Shining Ones from around the world. From the papyrus of the scribe of Ani in Egypt, in very truth I am a shining one and a dweller in light who hath been created and who hath come into being from the body of the God. I am one of the shining. From India, in the earliest Vedic literature, all supernatural beings are called Devas and Asuras. The etymological roots of Deva means a shining one. Ireland, the Tuatha de Danann are a supernatural race in Irish mythology, also known as the Shining Ones. Celtic. Belenus is a sun god from Celtic mythology, called the Fair Shining One, or the Shining God. Greece. The Greeks called Apollo Phoebus, which means the Shining One. And there are many more examples. So how did they shine? From the Sumerian tablets, Enki took the belt, crown, and Malamu, or mantle of radiance. According to Anthony Green and Jeremy Black, the deities wore melam, an ambiguous substance which covered them in a terrifying splendour. According to A. Leo Oppenheim, melamu is associated with some sort of sparkling headwear, like a crown or even a luminous mask. From 2 Enoch we have another description. And the Lord said to Michael, Go and take Enoch from out of his earthly garments and anoint him with my sweet ointment and put him into the garments of my glory. He is then given an ointment which is more than the great light, shining like the sun's rays, and when he looked at himself, he looked like one of the glorious ones. Enki is the son of Anu, the father of the gods. Enki is the lord of the earth. He plants a great fruit tree in his garden at Eridu. He is described in Sumerian hymns as the great dragon. He is the creator of Adapa, the first civilized man. He gives Adapa forbidden knowledge reserved for the gods, but denies him immortality. Walter Matfeld wrote, Enki is not only one of several prototypes that was later transformed into Eden's serpent, he is also one of several prototypes that was transformed into Eden's god, Yahweh Elohim. 
At the bottom of the map, we can see Eridu, Enki City. The creation story, date 4550 BC. Genesis, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. They were guardians of the earth. Let us make man in our image. How many gods were there? Why didn't they say, let us make a man? Because man was already existing. So they took an existing man and made them in their likeness. In the Babylonian Enuma Elish, Enki advises they create a servant of the gods out of clay and blood. Upon him may the services of the gods be imposed, that they may rest. The blood came from Kingu, one of their own. Clay represents a human. They are creating a royal bloodline to take over the work of ruling directly. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. One was the Tree of Life. This is the same concept as the Kabbalah Tree of Life seen on the left, and also the Sumerian Tree of Life seen on the right. Kabbalah has ten attributes or emanations from God called Sephiroths. The top Sephiroth is called Keta, which is the all-seeing eye. The aim is to reach the top, become a god, and create your own reality. The other tree in the garden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, also the Kabbalah tree, because Kabbalah has two paths, left hand and right hand. The left hand path represents knowledge of good and evil. The right hand path represents the tree of life, immortality. The left hand path represents the sons of darkness. The right hand path represents the sons of light. Both paths achieve illumination, they just use different methods. They have the same concept in India. Vamachara means black magic or left hand path. Dakshinachara means upright in conduct or right hand path. The occult doesn't distinguish between good and evil. It's merely seen as expressing yourself without constraint. And God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. The serpent in the garden of Sumerian Eden, or biblical Eden. Genesis 3. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. They're talking about the third eye being opened. If we compare the Sumerian and the Bible versions of the story, Enki told Adapa not to take the food and water of immortality or he would die. Whereas Yahweh tells Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit or they will die. Anu, the father of the gods of Sumeria, tells Adapa the food and water will make him immortal, like a god. Whereas in the Bible, it's the serpent tells Eve the fruit will make her like a god. A good candidate for the Bible serpent is the Sumerian god Ningishida, shown on the left as the two snakes coiled round a staff with a pine cone on the top. There is a dragon either side. The pine cone at the top of the staff represents the pineal gland, which alongside the hypothalamus is awakened during the Kundalini experience. Ningishida was a tree god. The name means Lord of the Sacred Giving Tree in Sumerian. He became associated with fertility the underworld and the healing force of nature. On the left, we see the serpent energy climbing up the spine or the tree of life, the 33 degrees of Freemasonry or the 33 vertebra of the spine. Next to that is the Kabbalah tree, the tree of life. We also see the wings with the two serpent energy reaching the top. The wings are the ascension to the higher realm. And then we see the Bindi, the third eye, the all seeing eye. It's all the same thing. The Bible's version of Ningishida could well be the Seraphim. The Book of Enoch calls the Seraphim serpents. They accompany the cherubim as the heavenly creatures closest to Yahweh. The Hebrew word used for the serpent in the Garden of Eden is Nakash, which also means the shining one. Ningishida, or Seraphim, or the shining one. Ningishida is described as bearing Melamu, or black flame. In Islam, Henry Corbin makes reference to black light, which is a survival of the concept of Malamu and the underworld. This light represents the highest spiritual stage towards enlightenment. This black light is of the Islamic shaitan, the adversary, and is a light which attacks, invades, 
annihilates, then annihilates annihilation. According to the Order of Phosphorus for Daughters of Lilith, which seems to be a Luciferian website, medieval alchemists had a name for the concept of this light, which they associated as the light in the depths of darkness. The light they write of, Melamu, is called the sun in the earth. The earthly invisible sun is called black sun and fire of hell. Pelutu or Ni is the emotion humans experience in the presence of a god or demon who has the melam power. Ni creates fear, enabling them to feed from the excess energy released. Descriptions of the shining ones seem to indicate they are very tall and pale. They may be wearing feather cloaks with some sort of luminous glow or they are shining metaphorically. These gods appear as fish, birds or serpents, may be coming from shamanism. They seem to have an advanced knowledge and practice black magic. Adam, the new hybrid human, was now ready to represent the gods as the king and priest to the primitive people. You could call them the Adams family. Enki brought civilization to Eridu and built his temple. Sumerian mythology says Eridu was one of the five cities built before the flood and the city of the first kings. From the Sumerian kings list, after the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Alulim became king. Professor William Shea suggests that Alulim was a contemporary of the biblical figure Adam, who may have been derived from a dapper of ancient Mesopotamian religion. On the left, we have the ten generations from Adam to Noah before the flood. On the right, we have the ten kings in Sumeria before the flood. If Adam was Alulim, the first Sumerian king, can we find any other correlations? Let's look at the highlighted names Enoch, Methuselah and Noah. Enoch and Amen Jirana. Enoch was taken to heaven and taught the secrets of heaven and earth. Enoch's lifespan is a solar year, 365 years or days. Amen Jirana's advisor, Utuapsu, was taken to heaven by the god Shamash and Adad and taught the secrets of heaven and earth. Amen Jirana was the founder of the priests of the sun god. Methuselah and Ubaratutu. Methuselah lived until the ark was built. He was the grandfather of Noah. Ubaratutu was the king of Sumer until a flood destroyed his land. He was the father of the Sumerian Noah. Noah and Zayasudra. So Max Malaman wrote, We know from the Vel Blundel prism that at the time of the flood, Zayasudra, the Sumerian Noah, was the king of the city of Shurapak, where he received warning of the impending disaster. We've seen the Sumerian kings through Adam's son Seth, but what of his other alleged son, Cain? Genesis 4. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The verses below indicate there were two bloodlines. Genesis 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. 1 John. Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. According to the Zohar, after this they gave birth to the first son. He was the son of defilement, because two had intercourse with Eve, and she conceived from both and gave birth to two. Cain and Abel. Each resembled his own father and their spirits were separated, one to the side of impurity and one to the side of holiness. Each was in the appearance of his own aspect. To summarise, Adam wasn't the first man as mankind already existed. He was the first Sumerian king doing the service of the gods for the Shining Ones. Ancient history indicates that the Shining Ones bred with humans, creating a hybrid royal priesthood to manage the people. Cain and Seth had different fathers and looked different from each other. Enki, the biblical Satan, the adversary, is the father of Cain. Anu or Enlil, the biblical Yahweh, is the father of Abel and Seth. Cain's bloodline are the sons of darkness. Seth's bloodline are the sons of light. The line of Cain and Seth battle each other to this day. It's called the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. A war between two shining ones. We will follow the bloodlines of Cain and Seth. Wars and slavery start to appear in history. The first war was recorded in 3500 BC in the city of Kish in Iraq. Slavery was recorded in 1800 BC by Hammurabi in Babylon in Iraq. Cain's family were the first Masons. Cain built a city named after his son. Tubal Cain was a descendant of Cain. 33rd degree Freemason and Master Rosicrucian Manly P. Hall wrote, 
the mason must follow in the footsteps of his forefather, Tubal Cain. The fallen angels and the Nephilim, they join forces with the line of Cain, the sons of darkness. The book of Enoch describes the arrival of the fallen angels, and they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, which is in Lebanon. They taught mankind writing, sorcery, weaponry, cosmetics, enchantments, astrology and abortion. Genesis 6 describes how the sons of God, the fallen angels, had sex with human women and produced savage giants that were cannibals and drank blood. They were called the Nephilim, which is Hebrew for the fallen ones. In the book of Numbers, spies report that they have seen fearsome giants in Canaan. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, or the Anunnaki. If you want to know where the giant bones have gone, ask the Smithsonian Institute. In the centre of the map is Mount Hermon in Lebanon, where the Nephilim lived. I'm looking for the Nephilim. But who were these Nephilim? I think Professor Jerry Schroeder should be able to help me decode this biblical mystery. Genesis is his thing. You know, you read Genesis and there's... Nephilim, there's fallen ones. Who are these guys? When they fall, Nephil is a Hebrew word which means fallen or lower down or, or sub, you know, less than perfect. And the Bible says there existed at the time of Adam beings that were completely human in shape and in intelligence. But they weren't humans. They lacked the neshama. The soul. The soul of humanity. Before the neshama, if you didn't look before like... Before the soul. Before the soul of humanity. If you didn't look like me, smell like me, and talk like me, I had you for dinner, literally. It was a dog, it was a wild world. Kind of humans with souls and humans without. Humans with souls and hominids without. I keep going back there. Human-looking beings, but without the neshama, without the soul of, hum of human life. We got Lebanon, Babylon. 4th millennium BC, we've got 42 individuals were found in the initial excavation and at least half of them displayed intentional deformation. The Sumerian culture begins in Iraq around 4500 BC. No one really knows where they came from, but according to a 4000 year old inscription by Sumerian Lu Dingir Ra, we migrated to where we are living now thousands of years ago. Our people came to this land from a mountainous country to the northeast. Great Enlil, who is the half-brother of Enki and son of Anu, had some of us dark heads settle here. According to rumours and the results of my research as to why we have called ourselves dark heads, I found out that before our forefathers migrated here, blonde-haired and blue-eyed people were living next to their country. Forensic archaeologist Jane Shooter and other archaeologists suggest that Sumerians were dark-skinned dark-eyed and dark-haired. The Sumerian figures you see below represent the ruling class. Skeletons found in Israel dated 4500 BC had genes for blue eyes, different from the local population. Some of their genes came from Turkey and Iran. Almost 50% of the people in this Middle Eastern population had blue eyes. The Journal of Human Genetics published research on a mutation in a gene called OCA2, responsible for blue eyes. The mutation occurred around 6000 BC in an individual from the Black Sea region. The map shows blue eyes found in Israel traced back to Iran and Turkey and the blue eyed gene traced back to the Black Sea region. Circumcision, date 4000 BC. Evidence suggests that circumcision was practiced in the Middle East by the fourth millennium BCE when the Sumerians and the Semites, or Akkadians, moved into the area that is modern-day Iraq from the north and west. The book, The Fathers According to Rabbi Nathan, contains a list of persons from the Israelite scriptures that were born circumcised. Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, etc. Apostia is a rare congenital condition in humans in which the foreskin is missing at birth. Is this a genetic trait of the line of Seth? Does this mean the Shining Ones lack a foreskin? Is circumcision meant to emulate the Shining Ones? 
Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4,000 and 3,100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. At the same time in Egypt, we have the Shemsu Hor, or known as the Seven Sages, the followers of Horus, the Children of Light, date unknown to 3000 BC. The Egyptian Book of the Dead says, Perfect is the Eye of Horus. I have delivered the Eye of Horus, the Shining One. According to the building text found at the Temple of Edfu in Egypt, the Shemsu Hor were a race of sages who dwelt on ten pre-Diluvian islands. One of their elders was Thoth, known to the Greeks as Hermes and Romans as Mercury. According to the Manetho, the Egyptian historian, we find that at the dawn of the historic period, Egypt was divided into two rival kingdoms of the north and south, both ruled by a royal house, an aristocracy of the same race, and both known traditionally as the followers of Horus. The Shemsu Hor are recognised as the dominant priestly caste in pre-dynastic Egypt until approximately 3000 BC being mentioned in the Turin Papyrus and the list of the kings of Abydos. Professor Emery, the famous Egyptologist, author of Archaic Egypt, discovered the remains of individuals who lived in the pre-dynastic epoch. These presented a disproportionately long head, larger than that of the local ethnic group, fair hair and a taller, heavier build. Emery declared that this stock wasn't indigenous to Egypt and had performed an important priestly and government role in this country. This race kept its distance from the common people, blending only with the aristocratic classes, and the scholar associated them with the Shemsu Hor, the disciples of Horus. Just before the turn of the 20th century, Wallace Budge, keeper of the Egyptian department at the British Museum, excavated six well-preserved bodies. These pre-dynastic mummies were found in a shallow grave near Gebulun. But it was the mummy with tufts of orange hair, aptly nicknamed Ginger, that curators and forensic scientists were intrigued with the most. In the Book of Noah, we have a description of his birth. Unto Lamech, my son, there hath been born a son, the like of whom there is none, and his nature is not like man's nature, and the colour of his body is whiter than snow, and redder than the bloom of a rose, and the hair of his head is whiter than white wool, and his eyes are like the rays of the sun. And he opened his eyes and thereupon lighted up the whole house. Lamech was afraid of him and fled and came to his father Methuselah. And he said unto him, I have begotten a strange son, diverse from and unlike man and resembling the sons of the God of heaven. Remember Enoch's description of an angel with hands whiter than snow. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Noah or Zayasudra, king of Shurapak in Sumeria, Iraq, 2900 BC. Scholars generally agree that the flood occurred between 2900 BC and 2800 BC. Excavations revealed flood remains in Shurapak dated to 2950 BC to 2850 BC. Comparing the Sumerian story to the Bible, Anu and Enlil plan to destroy humanity because they make too much noise at night. Yahweh wants to destroy humanity and the Nephilim because they were all corrupt. Enki saves Sumerian Noah from the flood. Yahweh saves Noah from the flood. In the Indian Vishnu Purana, Vivasvata was the king of Dravida before the great flood. He was warned of the flood by the Matsya, fish avatar of Vishnu, and built a boat that carried the Vedas, Manu's family, and the seven sages to safety. The Egyptian Book of the Heavenly Cow describes the destruction of mankind in which humanity plots against the sun god Ra. The goddess Hathor is chosen by Ra to act as the violent eye of Ra. 
She was to deliver divine punishment to humanity and did so by slaughtering the rebels and bringing death into the world. The survivors of Hathor's wrath were saved when Ra tricks Hathor. The seven sages represent the sons of light, spreading their enlightenment and illumination around the world, or the right-hand path of Kabbalah. In Sumeria, the seven sages were known as the Apkalu. Adam, Adapa, Alulim would have been one of them. Professor William Wolfgang Hallow of Yale University stated that Alulim was one of the seven demigods known as Apkalu. In India, the seven sages were known as the Saptarishi. Manu, the Indian Noah, took the seven sages in his boat to safety. Egypt, Thoth and the seven sages, the Shemsu Hor. In the Temple of Edfu, it's written that the temple was built by the seven sages, the senior ones and the followers of Horus, who lived on the primeval mound which was consumed by a flood. The seven sages created the new world after the flood. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem and Japheth. Seth's bloodline came through Shem, the sons of light. Cain's bloodline survived through Ham and Japheth, but especially Ham's son Canaan. These are the sons of darkness. This map shows us the movements of this royal hybrid family around the world. They name each primitive culture they conquer after themselves. History shows that Shem, Ham and Japheth spread into each other's lands. The line of Seth and Shem, the sons of light, the Endoarians. The Marianu or Amuru or Amorite Indo-Aryans. 3300 to 1200 BC. Mariano is an ancient word for the caste of chariot-mounted hereditary warrior nobility, which existed in many of the societies of the Middle East during the Bronze Age. The term is attested in the Armana letters written by Harpy. Robert Drews writes that in the singular, Maria means young warrior in Sanskrit. He suggests that at the beginning of the late Bronze Age, most would have spoken either Hurrian or Indo-Aryan, but by the end of the 14th century, most of the Levant Marianu had Semitic names. The Aryans Several writers and historians have traced the origins of the Aryans to the Caucasus Mountains region. Herodotus wrote, In ancient times the Greeks called Iranians Kafir, but they were renowned as Aryans amongst themselves and their neighbours. The term Aryan derives from the ancient Indian Vedic Sanskrit and Persian Avestan term Arya for noble. The Aryan tribes in northern India called their land Arya Vata. The map shows where Aryans were reported in the Caucasus Mountains, Iran and northern India. It's important to remember we are following the genetic traits of the royal bloodlines, not the people they rule over. Arata, the mystical land in the records of Sumeria and India. Arata seems to stretch from Armenia through Iran to Aryavata in northern India. Noah's Ark landed in the mountains of Ararat in a region called Uratu in Armenia. Enmerka and the Lord of Arata is a legendary Sumerian account of the conflicts between Enmerka, king of Uruk, and the unnamed king of Arata. Arata is an ancient land and tribe mentioned in the Mahabharata and Vedas. Enmerka and Lugalbanda were two early kings of Uruk, Sumeria who fought in the Mahabharata war. Aratas consider themselves the descendants of Buddha. 32 signs of a great man are described in the Pali Canon. They are believed to have formed the basis for early representations of the Buddha. Number 29 is eyes deep blue. Number 14, golden hued body. Minor marks, number 80, his body emanates a halo of light. Buddha was of royal blood. His name was Prince Siddhartha Gautama. Japheth, the Sons of Darkness. Let's look at the Anglo-Saxon royal genealogies. The majority of the surviving pedigrees trace the families of Anglo-Saxon royalty to Woden. The Anglo-Saxons preserved their royal genealogies. The earliest source for these genealogies is Bede, who in his Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation said of the founders of the Kingdom of Ghent, the first two commanders are said to have been Hengist and Horsa. They were the sons of Vic Gilsus, whose father was Vector, son of Woden, from whose stock the royal race of many provinces deduced their origin. 
The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles and the Textus Rofensis continue their pedigrees back to the biblical patriarchs Japheth, Noah and Adam. They also served as the basis for pedigrees that would be developed in the 13th century Iceland for the Scandinavian royalty. Japheth in Georgia According to the medieval Georgian chronicles, the legendary patriarch of the Georgian nation, Mutsketos, was the son of Kartlos, the son of Targamos, the Georgian spelling of biblical Togama, son of Gomer, son of Japheth, son of Noah. According to the chronicles, the descendants of Targamos successfully resisted the attacks of the Nimrodians. The Amnaya culture, the first horse warriors, date 3300 BC. Another step culture seizes the mantle of horse kings. They are called the Yamnaya. Bands of nomads who roamed a territory north of the Black and Caspian Seas at the start of what's called the Bronze Age. By about 3000 BC, they become the greatest horse culture of the ancient world. Linguists have long maintained that many languages in Europe and Asia, including ancient Greek and Roman, Romance languages like French and Spanish, Germanic languages, including English and the Scandinavian languages, even Russian and Indian Sanskrit, all derive from a common language source. The Curse of Ham, the Sons of Darkness. Ham had a son called Canaan. Genesis 9. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. The Holman Bible Dictionary says, The sons of Canaan in the Table of Nations include the Hittites and Hivites, who were of Indo-European origin. The Hivites are a branch of the Canaanites. Sarah Ruth Ashcraft, an alleged satanic ritual abuse survivor from an Illuminati family, wrote this about the Hivites. Someone asked me who are the Hivites. Answer. All of the terrorists in the entire world, including Isis and Antifa, and every deep state ever, are part of an ancient Babylonian cult family who have dominated and ruled every civilization on earth since biblical times, 6,000 plus years. They claim they descend directly from the Garden of Eden through Cain's line, and that Cain's parents were actually Lilith, the female half of God in the Talmudic tradition, and a demon she made, aka the serpent or the devil. Canaan had Cush, who had Nimrod, Nimrod ruled the world, the old world order. From the book of Jasher, and all the nations and tongues heard of his fame, and they gathered themselves to him, and they bowed down to the earth, and they brought him offerings, and he became their lord and king, and they all dwelt with him in the city at Shina, and Nimrod reigned in the earth over all the sons of Noah, and they were all under his power and counsel. And all the earth was of one tongue, and words of union. But Nimrod did not go in the ways of the Lord, and he was more wicked than all the men that were before him, from the days of the flood until those days. The Targum Pseudo Jonathan states that Nimrod was the father of a pharaoh. Nimrod was en Merkur, the king of Uruk, date 2900 BC to 2600 BC. The Sumerian tablets and the Bible both have a similar story of the Tower of Babel. En Merkur of Uruk is built in a massive cigarette in Eridu and demands a tribute of precious metals from Arata for its construction. Genesis 11 But the Lord, seeing that their work will strengthen their rebellion against him and hurt his children in the earth, said, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. In the Sumerian story of En Merkar and the Lord of Arata, the whole universe, the people in unison to Enlil in one tongue spoke. Then Enki, the Lord of Abundance, whose commands are trustworthy, the Lord of Wisdom, who understands the land, the leader of the gods, endowed with wisdom, the Lord of Eridu, changed the speech in their mouths, brought contention into it, into the speech of man that until then had been one. Nimrod and Freemasonry In the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry we find, the legend of the craft in the old constitutions refers to Nimrod as one of the founders of masonry. Thus in the York MS number one we read, At ye making of ye Torah Babel, there was a masonry first much esteemed of, 
and the king of Babylon, ye called Nimrod, was a mason himself, and he loved well masons. One of the secret words of masonry is Yabalon, which stands for Yahweh, Baal, and Osiris, after the city of On. Top left is the Masonic Bible, bottom left is Baal, bottom right is Osiris. Notice how Osiris and Baal have both got the same kind of hat with a bobble at the top. I think they're the same god. Masons grudgingly accept Yahweh as a god. That's because Yahweh is part of the Shining Ones family. The double-headed eagle first appears in the city of Lagash, Sumeria, Iraq, 2600 BC. The middle picture is from Turkey where the Hittites adopted the symbol. It is also an established symbol for the Freemasons. This bloodline spread the symbol far and wide, Egypt, Rome, America, even Germany during World War II, Russia, Ukraine, and there are hundreds of others. The first record of circumcision appears in Egypt, 2350 BC. Now, let's follow the line of Seth through Shem, the son of Noah, known as the Sons of Light, into China, India, and Egypt. Ancient mummies are discovered in a desert in western China. Their deep eyes, thin lips and blonde hair amaze Chinese archaeologists because they look European. The discovery of these Caucasian mummies defies history as we know it. Where did they come from? Why did they move into China? And what fate led them to vanish into the desert air? The Indo-Aryan migration into India, date 2000 BC. The most recent study on this subject, led by geneticist David Reich of Harvard University, was published in March 2018 and co-authored by 92 scholars. The study showed a major migration into India after 2000 BC of Indo-Aryans from the Eurasian steppe. They likely brought with them an early version of Sanskrit, mastery over horses and a range of new cultural practices such as sacrificial rituals, all of which formed the basis of early Hindu Vedic culture. The swastika is an ancient religious symbol of the Indo-Aryans. The word swastika comes from Sanskrit. In Hinduism, the right facing symbol is called swastika, symbolizing the sun, prosperity and good luck, while the left facing symbol is called salvestika, symbolizing night or tantric aspects of Kali. Once again, we have the left and right hand path of Kabbalah. Here we see the Indo-Aryan royal priesthood leading their people into India from the Eurasian steppe or the Black Sea region. If we compare Hinduism to the Bible, we see that the cherubim have four wings and four faces, and Brahma has four faces. The cherubim carry the throne chariot of Yahweh, known as the Merkaba, Garuda carries Vishnu as his vehicle, called the Vahana. The Aryan Royal Priests in India Flavius Josephus wrote that the Greek philosopher Aristotle had said, These sons of light are derived from the Indian philosophers. They are named by the Indians Kalani. Clerchus of Soli wrote, They descend from the philosophers of India. The philosophers are called in India Kalanians. The name of their capital is very difficult to pronounce. It is called Jerusalem. Megasthenes was sent to India by Seleucus Nicator about 300 years before Christ. He said they were an Indian tribe or sect called Kalani. Martin Haug, PhD, wrote, The Magi are said to have called their religion Kesh e Ibrahim. They traced their religious books to Abraham, who was believed to have brought them from heaven. Voltaire believed Abraham descended from some of the numerous Brahmin priests who left India to spread their teachings throughout the world. The Mitanni kings were mainly Hurrian or Marianu. Their empire controlled Amorites, who included Habiru and Jebusites. King Baratana of Mitanni expanded his empire around 1650 BC. The Hyksos seemed to be the same mix of people as the Mitanni, perhaps an outpost of theirs. They take over Lower Egypt around 1650 BC. They're known as the Shepherd Kings. The Hebrews are known as Shepherds and Kings. Eusebius quoted Eupolemus as saying, Around the time of Abraham, the Armenians, who are the Mitanni, invaded the Syrians. 
Abraham was born in Haran in Mitanni territory. The Mitanni kingdom is in the same area as the Blue Eyes and Aryans were reported. Abraham was born in Haran, an area under Mitanni control. Bottom left is the Mitanni royal seal. The sun disk with wing symbol is also used in Iraq, Iran, Syria and Egypt. It is the Aryan eagle, a symbol of sun worship. Abraham must have been a king or someone of high importance. Genesis 17, I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. Genesis 12, and it came to pass that when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Genesis 14, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born into his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Muhammad was a shining one from the royal house of Hashem. Abraham took Hagar as his concubine and had Ishmael, the father of Islam. According to the Midrash and the book of Jasher, Hagar was the daughter of a pharaoh. Jureri reported, I said to Abu Tufel, did you see Allah's messenger? May peace be upon him. He said, yes, he had a white handsome face. Who amongst you is Muhammad? At that time, the prophet was sitting amongst us, leaning on his arm. We replied, this white man, reclining on his arm. Narrated by Anas bin Malik. Allah Almighty blessed the beloved Rasul, messenger, with the title of Shining Star. He has also praised the beauty of his luminous face. Abraham had Isaac, who had Jacob and Esau. Genesis 25. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Malachi. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Esau, father of the Edomites. Genesis 36. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Cain, Canaan, and Esau were all cursed by Yahweh. If Esau had red hair, was this a genetic trait of the Canaanite bloodline? Esau had a grandson called Amalek, who founded a nation of Amalekites. They are to this day the enemy of the Israelites. And I have a quote from my mother, who was a mind control programmer for the DuPont family. 3,000 year heritage, Amalekite witch. Mother to daughter, 3,000 year bloodline heritage, Amalekite witch. Okay? We're not playing with her. And uh, she said the most important thing to the Illuminati is the collective subconscious. The Hyksos kings ruled until around 1550 BC until the Egyptians kicked them out. Josephus quoting Manetho seems to link the Israelite exodus with the Hyksos. After the conclusion of the treaty they left with their families and chattels, not fewer than 240,000 people, and crossed the desert into Syria. Fearing the Assyrians who dominated over Asia at the time, they built a city in the country which we now call Judea. It was large enough to contain this great number of men and was called Jerusalem. Treaties are usually followed by royal marriages. Three Mitanni kings sent their daughters to be married to pharaohs. The Mitanni bloodlines are shown in green. Notice how these kings have Arata in their name. This is because they come from the Indo-Aryan land of Arata. The offspring of these marriages included Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. Yuya was vizier to Tutmosis IV. The biographical dictionary of ancient Egypt suggests Yuya may have had some Mitannian ancestry and was possibly the brother of Queen Mutemwia. Here is Yuya and his wife Tuya. This is Yuya. And this is Tuya. They're the grandparents of Akhenaten, who is now known to be King Tut's father. They were found intact in their tomb, and their identities are certain.
Yuya and Chuya had Queen Tai. Famous Egyptologist William Flinders Petrie said Queen Tai was of Armenian origin and brought the art and religion to Egypt from her native land, Armenian Kingdom of Mitanni, and taught it to her son. Redhead Queen Tai, daughter of Yuya and Tuya, wife of Amenhotep III, mother of Akhenaten. The Mitanni Hittite Peace Treaty was signed in 1380 BC. It seems to mention Indian Rig Veda gods. This shows the Indo Aryan origins of the Mitanni. The first time Yahweh, the god of the Bible, is mentioned in history is the Shasu of Yahweh, 1386 BC to 1349 BC. The name appears in a list of Egypt's enemies inscribed on column bases at the Temple of Soleb built by Amenhotep III. The list mentions the Shasu of Yahweh. Amenhotep III had Akhenaten. We see Nefertiti holding another daughter on her lap, pointing back to Akhenaten, and yet a third daughter, the youngest one, on her shoulder playing with her earring. And I think it's immediately apparent that there's something wrong with their anatomy. If we look at the children or we look at Nefertiti or Akhenaten, we see swollen bellies, very thin arms, and elongated skulls forms that have made art historians wonder whether there was something medically wrong with Akhenaten. These are the Amana princesses, thought to be the daughters of Akhenaten. Below left is Tutankhamun as a child and a CT scan of his head. On the right is the skull believed to be Akhenaten's, found in KV-55. And on the far right is a bust of Nefertiti, his wife. King Og of Bashan was to become the last surviving giant or Nephilim in the Bible. The Lost Book of King Og describes his war with Moses, dated around 1400 BC. Then before the army of 100,000 giants, Anak helped King put on the whole armour of Baal so that he would be able to stand against the wilds of the incoming circumcised. So King Og took to himself the whole armour of Baal of the earth so that he would withstand on day of war and having done all to stand, King Og stood with his feet apart having girded his loins with the truth of the uncircumcised, he wore the breastplate of Baal of the Moon. Deuteronomy 9 A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? The uncircumcised were the sons of darkness, the circumcised were the sons of light. This is King Og's opinion of Moses. Corrupt little worm, smaller self Moses. My spies have told I, Og, of your smaller self army and their worship for any god but yours and your murderous solutions. Of your time in Egypt, of your commandments of laws, of your violence and madness, all in the name of your faecal insect sized god. Is not your hypocrisy shining as a beacon before you? You who should not kill because of your god's commandments are the most murderous of all. My spies say that when you killed the king of Shihon, you killed the women and children, keeping the spoils. Your corrupt fecal god has driven you mad. Moses was a shining one. Exodus 34 And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again. Givorah is on the left-hand path of the Kabbalah tree. The numerical value of Givorah, 216, is 6 times 6 times 6. The Torah was given to Moses and Israel from the mouth of the Gevurah. And my friends, the key to the whole equation is the fact that we, what we're experiencing now, it's not really a conflict or a battle between the left wing and the right wing, liberal and conservative, Republican and Democrat. It's really something as simple as this entity um, that likes to call itself, I guess, Jewish, or I guess, you know, it likes to pretend that it's engaging in Tikkun Olam, it likes to pretend that it's helping the world, it likes to pretend that it's, uh, you know, striving for what it calls an open society, but this entity, or these people, they are called the Arab Rav. The Arab Rav are the group 
that were with Moshe Rabbeinu, with Moses, that basically when Moses went to the mountain for 40 days to talk to Hashem, they were the ones that got the people to um, worship the golden calf. There's this entity called the Arab of Rav, and they are the last battle that we're going to wage. These people are the last, so to speak, enemy that we're supposed to defeat. The Kahanim Priesthood, date 1300 BC. Moses' brother Aaron was the first Kohanim priest. He made the golden calf. Exodus 32, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. The surname Cohen indicates a Kohanim heritage. Their DNA can be traced back 3,300 years. This is from the International Association of Kohanim. Our mission is to offer the Kohanim worldwide a free DNA test in order to identify Cohen's from the lineage of Zadok, J2A4, the great-grandson of Pinchas ben Al-Azhar, in order to build the genealogical tree with members who share the same common ancestry in a time frame of 3,300 years, the precise time of birth of Pinchas ben Al-Azhar, the grandson of Aaron Ha-Cohen. The Kohanim have many surnames, including Cohen, Ko, Kern, Shapiro, Rappaport, and Levi. So where do we find the Kohanim Cohens in the present day? They have powerful positions across political parties in America and internationally. John Kerry is a Cohen, US Secretary of State. David Cameron is a Cohen from the Levitas family, ex-Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Donald Trump is surrounded by Roy Cohen, his lifelong advisor, an attorney, Michael Cohen attorney, Gary Kern, Chief Economic Advisor, Bill Clinton, William Cohen, Secretary of Defense, Hillary Clinton, Jared Cohen, Advisor, Bernie Sanders, Larry Cohen, Chairman of Our Revolution, Jonathan Cohen, U.S. Deputy Rep to United Nations. The Kohanim Priesthood came through Aaron to Zadok the Priest. The Jebusite hypothesis is that a Jebusite priest co-opted into the Israelite state religion. Jebus was the son of Canaan. Zadok joined the conspiracy among native Jerusalemites, i.e. Jebusites, including Nathan and Bathsheba, that displaced the rightful heir to King David's throne, Adonai, in favour of Bathsheba's son Solomon, thus hijacking the throne and succession for the party of the conspirators. Well, who would do such a thing? In the middle of this anthem, the Queen will prepare herself for her anointing. The act which began with the, act, with the invocation of the Holy Spirit. This is a most sacred part of the service, for it is the Queen's hallowing. Not until she has been anointed, as Solomon was anointed by Zadok, can she be crowned. British Israelism they claim the British throne is a continuation of the Davidic throne. The British royal family is of lineal descent from the house of King David via a daughter of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. According to this legend, the prophet Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch escaped with the king's daughters to Egypt. They later travelled to Ireland where one of the surviving Judahite princesses, Teotepi, married a local high king of Ireland. From this union, the Davidic throne was supposedly preserved having been transferred to Ireland, then Scotland and later England, whence the British monarchs are alleged to have descended. The Stone of Scone, which has been used in the coronations of Scottish, English and British monarchs for centuries, is traditionally claimed to be identical to both the Pillow Stone, which was used by the Biblical Patriarch Jacob, and the Coronation Stone of King David. There are several different versions of the story, depending on whether you look at Irish or Scottish sources. But three names tend to stay the same throughout each. Scotta, Guidel Glas, and Fergus Moore. With these three names, we can trace the Stone of Destiny back to biblical origins, all the way back to a princess of Egypt called Scotta. Scotta was the daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh, a contemporary of Moses, who left Egypt at the time of the Great Exodus with her husband, carrying the stone with her. They first travelled to Spain and then on to Ireland. Tophet is a Hebrew term from the Bible, 
used to refer to a site near Jerusalem at which Canaanites and Israelites were said to sacrifice children. On the left is an illustration. They burnt the babies. On the right we have Bohemian Grove. Guests include presidents, Republican and Democrat, royalty, heads of corporations, finance and military. They perform a similar ritual. Old habits die hard. Carthage, King Hiram of Tyre, Phoenician Canaanites, 970 BC to 936 BC. The phoenix comes from Phoenicia. On the right we see a picture of our royal bloodline celebrating their ancestry at the 2012 Olympics. King Hiram had close relations with the Hebrew kings David and Solomon. He sent cedar wood and skilled workers for the construction of the great temple in Jerusalem. They had a reputation for being great masons and engineers. Baal Hammon was worshipped in the Tyrian colony of Carthage as their supreme god. The archaeological record seems to bear out accusations in Roman sources that the Carthaginians burned their children as human sacrifices to him. Leviticus 18.21 And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. King Solomon 1 Kings then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. The seal of Solomon is the signet ring attributed to King Solomon in medieval Arabic tradition, and the predecessor to the Star of David. The ring gave him the power to command demons, jinn, genies, and spirits. The lesser key of Solomon is an anonymous grimoire on demonology. In one of the five books called the Asquatia, 72 demons are listed, including King Belial. Hiram Abiff is the central character for the third degree of Freemasonry. Hiram is the chief architect of King Solomon's temple. He is murdered for not revealing the Master Mason's secret passwords. Solomon became allied to Pharaoh, King of Egypt, by marriage and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. Carthage, the Rab Kohanim. The wealthy families of Carthage that dominated the city were the chief priests, known as Rab Kohanim. This position was hereditary and the priesthood was involved in state functions. That would include child sacrifice. The Kohanim bloodline comes from Aaron through Zadok. They are from the tribe of Levi, known as Levites. The descendants of Zadok form the priesthood, the Kohanim, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are collectively known as the Sanhedrin. The descendants of Zadok increased in rank and influence, so that his son Azariah was one of the princes of Solomon, and Ahimaaz, who married a daughter of Solomon, was probably another of Zadok's sons. The name Israel is first mentioned on the Menepta Stela, dated 1208 BC. El was the chief of the Canaanite gods and the original god of Israel. The word Israel is based on the name El rather than Yahweh. Israel equals Isis and Osiris, Ra and El. El is Yah, Yahweh. Osiris is Baal. Ra is On, as he was worshipped at the city of On. That gives us the Masonic password Yebalon, or Yahweh, Baal, On. Anu, Ra, El and Yahweh are the same God. Elohim can mean God or gods as the plural of El. The Hebrew Bible uses various names for the God of Israel. Elohim is the name of God used in the Elohist and priestly sources, while Yahweh is the name of God used in the Yahweh source. The Hebrew term Bene Elohim, sons of God or sons of the gods, in Genesis 6-2, compares to the use of sons of El in Ugaritic mythology. Ugaritic is Canaanite. Carol van der Torn states that gods can be referred to collectively as Bene Elohim, where it is used as the pantheon for Canaanite gods, the children of El. Albert Pike, a revered 33rd degree Freemason, wrote in Morals and Dogma, the Elohim watchers were seen as the hosts of heaven, travelling between worlds. Their leader, Yahweh Elohim, can be translated as leader of the Shining Ones. The family of gods or shining ones. Psalm 82. 
God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. El and his sons made up the assembly of the gods, each member of which had a human nation under his care. Deuteronomy said, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people, according to the numbers of the children of Israel. The Dead Sea Scroll says the number of the sons of God. In the Ugaritic Baal cycle, Canaanite, we read of 70 sons of Asherah. Each son of God was held to be the originating deity for a particular people. God had a wife. According to Belgian scholar Edward Lipinski, Mount Hermon is where El held court with his consort Asherah and the 70 sons of El. The Kuntelet Adrud text show that by 800 BC, the Israelites were still invoking Yahweh, El and Baal. The texts say, Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah, Yahweh of Taman or Edom and his Asherah. Asherah is identified as the queen consort of Anu, Sumerian, El, Canaanite, and Yahweh, Judaism. The Paraka skulls. They originate from the Black Sea region, date unknown. Then they appear in South America around 800 BC, around the time the Mitanni Empire collapses and Israel is established. These skulls are not due to head binding. The cranial capacity is larger and they lack the same sutures as a human skull. Could they be the bloodline of Cain or the Nephilim? I've been studying these, these people for about eight to 10 years. It seems that only the nobility of the Paracas culture of the coast of Peru had elongated skulls. And the preservation in that area is almost perfect. So we do have examples of the skulls with hair and the hair is always red and it's genetic red. It's not the result of bleaching or, or the sun or something like that. And so red hair originates in the Middle East, in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. So all Native American people in general are supposed to be of haplogroups A, B, C, and D, but this baby Paracas was tested and it's, it was not of haplogroup A, B, C, or D. It in fact was U2E1, another is T2, and with this one it is H1, that is Eurasian. DNA. And again, the one on the left was tested, and it was H2A, which seems to come from the Black and Caspian Sea. These are the results of the main DNA testing that was done, and only two of the 18 skulls showed to be Native American in terms of uh, its genetics or their genetics. But in the Black Sea, we also find skulls that look remarkably like the Paracas of the coast of Peru. The largest elongated skulls in the world are found in Paracas and also in the area of the Black Sea and Crimea like this baby. So is it possible that they navigated from the Black Sea and somehow found their way onto the coast of Peru? The origin of the Paracas skulls is in the Black Sea region, right next to the blue-eyed Aryans in Arata. Could this be the line of Seth and the line of Cain? We were able to do DNA testing of a baby that uh, died at 18 months and had strawberry blonde hair, which is not Native American. And the analysis that was done indicated that it had segments of DNA that do not match anything known to be human. Prakash scale DNA results included haplogroups T2, H1, H2A, J1, U2E1. Royal DNA. The last Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, has been shown to be of haplogroup T, specifically subclade T2. His descendants include wife of the Holy Roman Emperor and a large chunk of European royalty. Many European rulers have been found to be of this haplogroup in addition to haplogroup H. One branch of Kohanim DNA includes haplogroup J1. The question is, is that just a coincidence? The book of the prophet Ezekiel 
Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Merkaba mysticism started around 100 BC, inspired by Ezekiel's vision. In their visions, these mystics would enter into the celestial realms and journey through the seven stages of mystical ascent, the seven heavens and seven throne rooms. Such a journey is fraught with great danger, and the adept must not only have made elaborate purification preparation, but must also know the proper incantations, seals, and angelic names needed to get past the fierce angelic guards. Modern Descriptions of the Merkaba A Merkaba is a star tetrahedron, a three-dimensional eight-pointed star made from two triangular pyramids, one pointing up and the other one down. The Star of David is a two-dimensional version of a Merkaba. The Merkaba can draw source energy down to the physical and represents the concept of as above, so below from Freemasonry. The New Age, the Age of Light, representing the Sons of Light, describe the Merkaba this way. The Merkaba is our light body. A properly functioning Merkaba field has two tetrahedrons spinning incredibly fast in opposite directions, creating a light body that is capable of interdimensional and interstellar travel. When the Merkaba is activated, it forms a counter-rotating field of light, which works as an interdimensional gateway, allowing a higher consciousness to incarnate into the physical body permanently. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too good to me. If successful, it becomes possible to take the physical body into the fourth dimension. Other beings in this realm include nature spirits and angels. This is not a good idea. I advise you not to try this. However, this is how you activate your Merkaba. Meditate on the two light pyramids around your body spinning in opposite directions. As they spin, see them create a light field around your body. Meditate on your intention, knowing your Merkaba will work for you to achieve it. This is the same concept as the law of attraction found in the book The Secret and pushed by the New Age movements. That is the definition of magic, when your intent changes the reality around you. Light and dark magic are both from the shining ones. Neither of them are any good. They both want you to open the third eye so they have a channel into your light body. Merkaba in Hebrew means light spirit body. The Egyptians said, Ka is the shadow that man knows as life. Ba is the essence, living forever. In Kabbalah, Keta is the all-seeing eye. The Indonesian word Kapala means head, where the third eye is located. The Indonesian word for sun is Matahari. Mata means eye and Hari day, eye of the day. The Babylonian sun square equals 666 on all sides. In Egypt, we have Ka and Ba. In Arabia, Kaba. Kaaba, Allah, from El Ila, gives us Kabbalah. The sun is the eye, the light of the day. The number six in the occult signifies man. The sun is 666, the perfected man, the activated light body, the capstone on the pyramid. The third eye is opened, the Ba essence ascends on wings. The person is illuminated, the Illuminati, the shining ones. The descendants of Ezekiel and his priesthood were saved by Cyrus the Great in 539 BC. 
Isaiah 41. The second prophet predicts the coming of King Cyrus, who will liberate the Jews from their Babylonian captivity and will bring them to the promised land. Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. The word anointed means Moshiach or Messiah. The Sanhedrin celebrated Trump as a returning Messiah with a special edition 70-year redemption coin focused on generating an international effort to build the Third Temple. Darius the Great, 522 BC. Darius married two daughters of Cyrus the Great. An inscription left by Darius on the Behistun stone says, I am Darius the Great King, King of Kings, King of Countries, containing all kinds of men, King in this great earth far and wide, an Arian have an Arian lineage. Darius and Cyrus are sons of light and Trump is connected to them. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran, dated 165 BC to 110 BC, is called the war between the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. The Sons of Light are preparing for war against the Sons of Darkness. The first attack of the Sons of Light shall be undertaken against the forces of the Sons of Darkness, the army of Belial, the troops of Edom, Moab, the Sons of Ammon, the Amalekites, Philistia, and the troops of Kittim of Asher. Supporting them are those who have violated the covenant. The sons of Levi, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Benjamin, those exiled to the wilderness, shall fight against them. Belial is like Baal, the king of evil, the king of darkness. Edom is from Esau, who married Canaanite women. Solomon sacrificed children to Molech, who was worshipped by the children of Ammon. J. Parker told us about his mother, the Amalekite witch. And the war continues to this day. Directly after Trump won the election in November 2016, the Sanhedrin invited him to initiate a joint effort with Russian President Vladimir Putin in building the Third Temple. February 2020, the Sanhedrin mints a coin for the battle between the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. Persov said, throughout history, whenever any move is made to bring redemption, the dark side increases its efforts to topple the righteous. Amalek came to battle Israel at Rephidim, just before the giving of the Torah. Their final battle will be with Amalek, also known as the Arab Rav or the Sons of Darkness. Netanyahu, Putin and Trump are all on the side of the Sons of Light. Archbishop Vigano's letter to President Trump. June 7th, 2020. Mr. President. In recent months, we have been witnessing the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical the children of light and the children of darkness. The children of light constitute the most conspicuous part of humanity, while the children of darkness represent an absolute minority. And yet the former are the object of a sort of discrimination, which places them in a situation of moral inferiority with respect to their adversaries, who often hold strategic positions in government, in politics, in the economy and in the media. In an apparently inexplicable way, the good are held hostage by the wicked and by those who help them either out of self-interest or fearfulness. In these meetings, gestures count more than the words exchange. In particular, the Pope's gifts sent a profound message. <laughs> Like the Kohanim, the Pharisees descend from Zadok and are members of the Sanhedrin. The members of the Sanhedrin, the Kohanim, the Pharisees and the Sadducees plot to kill Jesus. Here's what Jesus and John the Baptist thought of them. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Matthew 23, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 3, 7. John the Baptist to the Pharisees. But when I saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Remember Esau with the red hair, who married the Canaanites, and his family were called Edomites? 
In 125 BC, John Hyrcanus conquered Edom and forced him to convert to Judaism. Herod the Great was an Edomite. He killed all the newborn children when he heard a child would be born who would become king. Jesus stood before his son Herod Antipas at his trial. Jesus was the true king of the Aryan branch of the bloodline. The Merovingian kings and European royals claim to be from this holy grail bloodline. Edom and Levi, who you could call royals and priests, now face up to Jesus. Edom, or the Edomites, represent the line of Cain, or the sons of darkness. Levi, or the Levites, represent the priesthood, the Kohanim, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or the sons of light. That's strange because Jesus represents the tribe of Judah, which is also the sons of light. Mark 3, 6 And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Jesus not only upset the royals and the priests, but also the bankers. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. The royals, the priests and the bankers joined forces to protect their interests, like a mafia family, one Illuminati family, divided but united by a common purpose. Now Jesus was still from that hybrid royal bloodline, and it appears he was a shining one too. Matthew 17 And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Psalm 45 describes him as fairer than the children of men. The book of Revelation includes John's vision of the Son of Man. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. John 12:35. Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Ra was invoked as the Aten, or the great disc that illuminated the world. Ra had a secret power name. Yahweh had a secret power name, yod heh vah -Heh, symbolized as a tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton in Greek means four letters and is symbolized as a swastika. Yahweh is symbolized as a swastika, or yod heh vah -Heh. The swastika is an Aryan symbol. Aryans must follow the Aten. Prayers end with Amun Ra at the end. The tribes of Israel were really the tribes of the Aten. We can see how the sun disk symbol spread around the world as the family's power grew. In the present day, we can see how branches of the family created the car companies. Remember the sun is the eye, so the sun disk symbol is also represented by the one-eyed gods. The one-eyed gods and the returning gods, we can also split them into sons of light and sons of darkness. For the sons of light we have India, Eye of Shiva, Persia, Ahura Mazda, Egypt, Eye of Ra or Horus, Asia, Buddha, Eye of the World. For the sons of darkness we have Arabia with the one-eyed Dajjal, Europe, the Eye of Providence, globally the all-seeing eye. Vietnam, Khao Dao, Norse, Odin or Woden. The one-eyed gods usually have an equivalent returning god. For the sons of light, Hinduism, Kalki on a white horse, Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah or Zoroaster, Judaism, the Mashiach, Buddhism, Maitreya, Christianity, Jesus and the New Age, Sananda. For the sons of darkness, Islam, the Imam Mahdi, Catholic, Lucifer or Osiris, Freemasonry, Lucifer or Nimrod, Rosicrucian, St. Germain, or Osiris, Theosophy, Lucifer. The sons of light using the right-hand path of Kabbalah created all our religions. They were known as the seven sages. The sons of darkness encouraged humans into black magic, human sacrifice and immorality. Both sides of Kabbalah aim to achieve enlightenment by opening the third eye. They claim to achieve a connection between the subconscious and other dimensions. These dimensions contain entities that they communicate with. As the family grew, they spread their branches into every country.
not only as royals, but eventually heads of government, industry, agriculture, finance, etc. Due to their internal conflicts, humanity hasn't been aware that we're run by one family. In part two, we will continue to trace them through history. You will see how the war between the sons of darkness and the sons of light affects every aspect of our lives today.